Welcome to another edition of Biblical Life TV. We've kind of taken a break with a lot of things that we've been doing, kind of rearranging some things, seeking the face of God, and just kind of getting a prophetic sense of where we are right now. If you're not aware spiritually, there is so much changing in the earth that uh, if, you, if you're not careful, you get so caught up in it that you don't know really where we are in the scheme of things, and we're going to begin a new series that I think is going to be paramount for where we are right now uh, in the prophetic timeline of both what God is doing, what the enemy is, is doing. And I'm going to call this the remnant boot camp. We need to understand that there's a war coming. And I'm not talking about the war on terror, that there is, it will be a religious war, it will be a philosophical war, it will be a war of ideologies. And if you've really been paying attention, that's kind of already being engaged in so many circles today that we, we're having people tell us that we can't believe what we believe, that we can't conduct ourselves according to our faith. There was a time in America that everyone understood that your religion was not just what you did in your house of worship. It's what you did in real life. And now they're beginning defining things, saying, but you have a right to meet in a house of worship, but we can control everything that you do once you leave that house. That is not the, the Constitution does not guarantee that we can only do things in a house of worship. It's that we have the freedom of religion, and religion is a philosophy of walking with God that you base your life on after you leave the house of worship. Now, maybe a lot of Christians have forgotten about that. That's why they leave their Bibles at church. They leave all these things at church, and they go in for one or two hours, and they leave it all behind. That is not really walking with God. That is, that is not the religious freedom that we're supposed to have. It's getting into this word, finding out how that you're supposed to walk with God, finding out his ways, and you live them out there. If we don't do that, and if we can't have that, then we do not have religious freedom in any nation. Now, guys, at first, and what we're seeing this a lot today, that at first it will be uh, a war of words and competing religious ideas. It will be a war toward a one-world religion, a new religion that has roots around the Tower of Babel, and its heart will be Mystery Babylon. And guys, one of the things that are coming, it's going to be a war to begin with at, at, the, at, the, at the, the beachhead of this war, if you will, before it really gets into a lot of other things, it's going to be a war of Christian versus Christian. Or I need to say it this way, the remnant versus the religious Christian. Those that have the relationship versus those that have a religious spirit. And uh, guys, there's, uh, I'm kind of glad that I'm not pastoring anymore for this reason. That the, one day the shepherds are going to wake up and they're going to find out that 90% of their flock are goats, and those goats are going to want to roast the shepherd and are going to eat them alive. We also need to realize that this, that this religious horde that's going on moves beyond Christianity. I believe that a religious spirit will morph itself into whatever it needs to be to get its agenda done. There's a religious spirit within Christianity. There's a religious spirit behind Buddhism. There's a religious spirit behind Taoism. There's a religious spirit behind uh, the, the Islam. There's a religious spirit behind a lot of isms out there. But we, I, I'm waking up to the fact that there are religious spirits behind political agendas. There's religious spirits behind political groups. They, they will get to where they have a fervor, a religious fervor about what they do, and they will worship their leaders. 
I am amazed, especially at the liberals, when you talk back at, at presidents like, uh, and they'll actually shorten their names, you know, it's, 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 it's not, uh, it's FDR, and they almost get this mystical, you know, JFK, LBJ, and they, they almost get almost this air of worship about them. That's one of the reasons why our current president, when he was first running for president, when he made the announcement, he, actually, you know, he first went to, uh, to Berlin where, the, uh, where the, the, the throne and everything from Pergamos was and that pantheon that was in Pergamos, and he recreated it in Colorado. This is well documented on the Internet. And what you, if you don't really read the book of Revelation, you don't understand Pergamos was where Almighty God said that's where the throne of Satan was. That invoked worship, another anointing. That political groups can have another anointing. That there is a religious spirit behind alternative sexual, uh, sexual orientation. That there is a religious fervor behind it. And that religious spirit would want to kill anything that opposes it. I am amazed. There's a, Dr. Michael Brown has been so successful. He has yet to lose a debate against a lot of these people, and so their reaction is he needs to be castrated, he needs to be murdered, and he needs to be cut into pieces. Uh, kind of sounds like the Inquisition to me. It's that same religious spirit. And that's going to begin manifesting in churches as there's through. I do not see, everybody seems to be talking about uh, everybody needs to come together. It's just a kumbaya moment. Let me tell you something. There's a great separation coming of the remnant from the religious horde because this religious horde will move from being religiously Christian to the new world religion that is going to be amalgamation of all of them around the concept of transhumanism and it's going to lead all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 where they're going to rally around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to become gods. And I'm not going to be teaching on exogenesis and all these different things that are going on. I've been listening to a lot of that this week. But it all amalgamates together. There is a new religion coming that is to push God out. It's going to release the old gods that were there before, that were there during the antediluvian age that were all promising an upgrade to humanity to leave the God of the Bible out of it and they themselves would become gods. We're on the very verge of that exploding right now. Nietzsche prophesied this, where he was looking at a time that we could throw away the constraints. See, he's the one that announced that God was dead. I mean, no, God's not dead, but I think it's kind of hilarious that in his former home there's a Bible factory. You know, God, God, God always has the last word about a lot of things. But in his philosophies, there's one of his books called Beyond Good and Evil where he talked about this ubermensch, this, this new man that came out that would be so evolved, he would be godlike, and for him there would not be good nor evil. Whatever he decided would be right. Kind of sounds a lot like in politics today, doesn't it? If I can get enough votes from you, whatever you want to do, I'll make right as long as you keep me in power. And when the, when the Antichrist comes, he will be the ultimate expression of that ubermensch that whatever he decrees, let's wipe out everybody on this continent, let's go ahead and take this people group and wipe them out if because he said it, it would be right. And we're, we're racing toward this we're racing toward the book of Revelation with, with a speed that is almost unparalleled. And as I see this going on, I see this war coming, I, I see this, uh, this religious spirit taking hold and beginning to already amalgamate into a one-world religion that we are, we, you know, we, we've had a current pope that says, it's all right, all religions are right. That's a, that is a major statement. As well as saying, oh, you Protestants, we, we just understand that you're, uh, that you're just uh, fallen Catholics, and it's, you can come back home. You can be Catholic and be married as a minister. You can, it's, it's okay, just come on back home. Well, I, I cease doing that since I keep the Sabbath. They no longer consider me a, an erring Catholic. I'm very glad. 
So some of the questions that as, as we're picking up the pace, and let me tell you something, their argument is going to be strong. It's going to be convincing. It's going to include signs and wonders. Technolo- There's a lot of technology today that's being suppressed, waiting for that time when they can flip the switch to invoke it as a part of this religion that's coming. And it's going to rival Moses, it's going to rival Jesus, it's going to rival a lot of things, and it's going to be a merging of science and the occult together. And so what's the remnant to do? Some of the things that we need to ask ourselves is how does the remnant repair and how do we tell the remnant from the religious? Right now it's kind of, it's, it's not necessarily that obvious unless you hit certain subjects and you can see the spirit of murder in their eyes that if they could shut you up by killing you, they would do it. I have seen it many a time. Sometimes I've seen it while in churches that, yeah, this one liked to kill me, this one liked to tar and feather me, this one just liked to beat me over the head with a club if he had half a chance. You see that there. But sometimes it's not so obvious. How do we tell? And what are the tell sell signs that there is, there's going to be this Christian versus Christian division? Now, my first knee reaction is, as I begin to ponder these things, was, well, I need to go to the book of Revelation. I need to go, and, and I, I've, uh, this last couple of years, it seems like God keeps on taking me back to certain books, and Revelation was one of them. And, and as I read through it, I go, Phew. you know, and, and Barry and I were talking this morning, and they say, you know, there are, there, people say, you know, you're just so gifted to be in this last generation. This is, the most, this is going to be the most challenging generation that has ever lived. Because we're going to have to face the Antichrist head on. We're going to have to face this swell of of support in this one world religion. And the remnant, the true remnant, are not going to be a part of that. They're going to have to separate themselves, spirit, soul, and body. And they're going to have to come out of Babylon. I've got a four-letter word for that. H-A-R-D. It's going to be one of the hardest things that have ever been done in the history of mankind. Because the entire mankind's going to have this herd mentality as well as this, as, this, as this ideology. Anybody opposed to this must be silenced at any cost. So I look to the book of Revelation. I see that, that it, but when we get into the book of Revelation, except for the warning, the, the correction and the fixing of the seven churches, which I believe are not just dispensational uh, or, or different dispensational ages, I think it's seven corrections to the remnant to get them ready. That's all that's there, and the rest of it, then, we're, we're, then it's like it's on. You know, after you, you get in, into the next chapter, it's just on. You're right in the middle of it. And so I, I need to have more preparatory insight to help prepare the room. There's some of the things that, that I've really been seeking the God, God about. And one of the things, and this, this is basically a part of, of ministerial training that a lot of Christians don't know, is the order in which... The, the, the books of the New Testament were written because the way a lot of preachers preach today, the crowning achievement of the New Testament is not the book of Revelation, at least by the way they act. It's the writings of the Apostle Paul, that everything else must be, you know, they, they even, it's almost the place they teach that almost Jesus has to bow his knee because his, you know, he t- told his stuff before Paul had his revelation, not ever considering that Jesus was the one who taught Paul when he was caught up into the third heaven. We call it the Pauline Revelation. Jesus set the Jewish rabbi down and says, let me tell you the rest of the story. But we forget that and we, we take snippets out of the Apostle Paul and make everything else bow its knee and lift that above everything else. And so really, his was, in fact, the book of Galatians was the first book ever written of the New Testament, written about 48 A.D., and it was written, uh, in fact, I've kind of come to the belief that it was written after the council in Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 15. Some speculate it was written before. Some also believe because of the correction that he was doing that the book of Hebrews was actually connected to the book of Galatians. That's why many still to this day attribute the book of Hebrews to the Apostle Paul. But as you go on, the very last of his books was written in, in 64 AD, and at 2 Timothy was the very last epistle of the Apostle Paul. And many believe that, uh, many historians believe that, it, that he finished that book the night before he ran to the executioners to be martyred. They didn't drag him, he ran, he was ready. He said, I've finished, I've run the race, I've finished the fight, I'm ready to check out my ticket and get out of here because I've, and I, I look at that. And, there's, and there is a 
stirring on the inside of me that when it's time for me to go, I want it to be, Lord, I've done absolutely everything that you have called me to do, and I don't have one last thing left. There's not one more letter that I could write. There's not one more sermon that I could preach. I want to know that I have finished the race and have done it properly. But that was in 64 AD, and it was not the last of the New Testament books written. That First and Second Peter was written after Paul finished his books. That Jude was written, and actually the last real writer of the New Testament was John. He wrote his gospels, or his gospel, and he wrote his epistles, and then he wrote the, the, the book of Revelation. So all this was stirring in his spirit. Now, one of the things that we need to kind of ask ourselves was, do you think the apostle John had read the epistles of Paul? 30 years later, very, very possibly. In fact, it is, it is more probable than it is improbable that he was very familiar with them. Yet in his writings, he writes some things in 1 John that if you don't really understand the heart of Paul would seem like they contradicted it when Paul was having to deal with some things in the book of Romans, if you don't really take it apart properly or you take Paul's writings out of context. But what you got to realize is God's word is in perfect harmony from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Therefore, Paul's writings are in perfect harmony when properly understood using the, the proper uh, contextual context with everything that John wrote. And I really believe that the Holy Spirit moved upon for, and John to write 1 John as a preparation for a book he would write later on called the book of Revelation. He writes the, the gospel of John or the book of John so that everybody might believe. Then he writes 1 John to prepare the remnant for what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. Therefore, I really believe that 1 John is paramount. While everybody else is avoiding it, it is paramount for the believer to understand. We, we, I, you know, I used to have Bibles that I could take out the book of Ephesians because I wore it out and pull it out and wave it at you and put it back in. We need to get to that place with First John. Because encoded within it, the apostle of love was preparing the remnant for the revelation of Jesus to, that is to come, that we're getting ready to see to unfold. And there are several major things that John speaks of. And what, what's really interesting to me, he deals a lot with the commandments of God. So much so that he says, if you say you know Jesus but don't do the commandments, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. Well, I mean, that right there would separate a lot of goat from sheep right now. He's, he's very, I mean, he's, the, God, the, the, the apostle of love is very succinct and very direct in 1 John. But some of the other things he deals with that we really need to get a hold of, he deals with truth and the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, and how that this would have a positive attitude toward the commandments of God. Regardless of what you're hearing preached on Christian TV today, and he also deals with the spirit of error and the and error in the church, the spirit of Antichrist, and the spirit of Antichrist is an antinomian spirit that is one that is always against the law of God. So if we're dealing with the very last books, you know, did, did the Apostle John not read the misinterpretation of the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians? where that this enmity that was, that was between all of us was nailed to the cross, and many of them have said that is God's commandments. Either one or two things happen. Either John is so far off of first base that he missed everything in his last books, or we have misinterpreted the Apostle Paul. Because he connects that antinomian attitude with the Antichrist, who is the lawless one the one who refused to come under the ways and the laws of God. And then he also begins to tell us how to tell which spirit an, indiv an individual is following. That discernment is going to be crucial in the days ahead. Because a religious spirit can give you all the sound bites. They know how to get their moves on during church. I remember years ago I was in one meeting and, and uh, this woman began to jerk and gyrate like we see a lot in church and, and, the, and the preacher stopped in the middle of the service and cast three demons out of her. 
said, that's not the Holy Ghost. He looked around, and there were eyes this big all over the congregation. Well, I kind of got the same gyrations, you know. But that was a spirit imitating what the, what the Holy Spirit looks like when they come on somebody. They, they got your moves. They, they can say the same things. They, they know how to say hallelujah in all the right places. They know how to say amen in all the right places. But on the inside, there's another spirit, and you have to have discernment. We need to realize today that the lines have been so blurred in the world and in the church that you can't tell them apart anymore. As in the days of Elijah, we have a complex blending of the concepts of the worship of Jehovah and Baal. The pagan and the sacred have been amalgamated together into something the apostles of old would no longer recognize. I think if the apostle... Paul, would be, if God would allow him to come down and see what's going on in the church today, the first thing he would start doing is preaching the cross, preaching salvation, and teaching you how to not be a pagan. I believe that with all my heart. We need the apostle who wrote so much about the days that we're going to be living in to give us clarity and to help us divide truth from error. And I want to start here in 1 John 1 and 1. And this is from the NASB. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of, of debate upon which versions to use, and I've done a little bit of research. The King James, the New King James, and the NASB are the only ones that do not use the Westcott and Hort New Testament uh, perversion, if you will. One was an agnostic, one was an occultist. And they actually changed what was in the original Greek that the King James, New King James, and the NASB are the closest to the original Greek and Hebrew that we have in the English language. So as long as you stick with one of those, you're okay. But always go back to the original Greek. Do some research yourself. Some of these other ones are so far beyond belief, it's, it's almost unimaginable. I, I read some like the Message Bible, and I'm thinking, well, she wouldn't have known what God said of that if it showed up with, po with pink polka dots on. She wouldn't have recognized it. And really didn't have the scholarship to do some of the things that they were claiming. In 1 John 1 and 1, this was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John starts out this epistle with the exact same phrase that is connected with the book of Revelation and his gospel. That, there, that, that, the, that which was from the beginning. In John 1, 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. And what we don't recognize is that there was a great debate going on in John's day that deals with this. But he also gives us a glimpse of what this is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. When Jesus appeared to him, he said, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so all, all three of John's books are connected with the same concept that he's trying to bring out. Now, when Jesus met with John on the Isle of Patmos, I guarantee you he did not speak to him in Greek. There's no record of when they walked the shores of Galilee that Jesus was teaching those guys Greek and talking to them Greek. He was talking Hebrew. They were, they were Jewish boys doing ministry in the earth, and they spoke Hebrew. The reason that John had it translated and he wrote into Greek was by that time he knew so many of the Gentiles had come into the church, and he had also understand, understood Paul's wisdom. Paul could have written all his epistles in Hebrew. He could have. But he chose to write them in Greek because Greek was the language of all the Gentiles. It was the common language of the era. And so by doing that, no one had to translate anything. And he was also able to reach to the Septuagint, which was the Greek version of the Tanakh that the rabbis had already translated the, the Tanakh from Hebrew to Greek over a century before. And so he had everything he needed to take the gospel to the Greek-speaking world. But he spoke with these two, when, when the Jewish Lord spoke to his Jewish disciple, he spoke to him in Hebrew. And he did not say, I'm the Alpha and Omega. He said, I'm the Aleph Tav. 
But it's really kind of, in the sense, the same thing. Alpha is the, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The only thing that you, do, that you miss is if you don't speak Hebrew, and it's the mystery of the Aleph Tav, that in the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 1, there was a secret that the rabbis have been debate, debating about for centuries. In Genesis 1, 1 in Hebrew, it's Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemaim et Haaretz. And that, that Aleph Tav, that et, is sitting right next to Elohim in the beginning. It's a connecting word in the Hebrew that is not pronounced in English. But the rabbis, because Moses, the writings of Moses are completely different than all the rest of the Bible. Now, it, it's all inspired. The Apostle Paul was, was very emphatic about that. As men, holy men of old were moved on by the Holy Ghost, they wrote. Except the books of Moses, the first four books, Moses dictated he did not author. Almighty God was the author of those first four books. God spoke it to him verbatim, word for word, in this order, and it is phrased this way. And Moses simply wrote down word for word what God said to him when he met with God face to face. And the rabbis understand that, so there's, there's deeper mysteries, specifically in Torah, that as you look in the Hebrew, it is there. And one of the great mysteries, they because they, they believe that not only is every letter and, and every word is positioned, and if there's a repeating, it's because it's significant and there's stuff encoded into there, that there was this olive tav that considered himself equal to God who was residing by God in creation. And so the rabbis for centuries have been debating, who is this word? In the beginning, there's this word that resides with God. And the Apostle John was saying, he's Messiah, he is the Olive Tav. And although you have, and, and this one, it's, it's, it's not yod heh vav -Heh, it's Elohim, because we don't see yod heh vav -Heh in the Genesis account until God creates man, that even Lucifer did not know him as yod heh vav -Heh. He only knew him as Elohim, which refers to the justice of God. That sitting right next to Elohim, there was a distinct work and a distinct representative of the Godhead called the Olive Tav that we understand there is a distinct work that he has in creation. And the Apostle John and Jesus both say that was him in the beginning. And the Olive Tav shows up in every single Messianic scripture in the Old Testament. Even when it talked about Abraham walked with God, between his ability for Abraham to walk in God, there was the Olive Tav. When in, in, in the prophecy where it says, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, the him, if you look in the King James Bible, is italicized because in the Hebrew it says, they shall look upon the Olive Tav they have pierced. They pierced the Olive Tav that was in the beginning. We need to kind of get Hebraic eyes in re-understanding. We, 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 have, we have far been too long looking through Greco-Roman eyes that we have dismissed the Old Testament when that's all Paul had, and he turned the world upside down with it. And we try with this Matthew through Revelation, and we can't get it done. We end up being amalgamated by, by the paganism around us because the only antidote to paganism is the Torah because God gave it to a people that were coming out of 400 years in pagan bondage as slaves. And so as we begin to get, to get Hebrew eyes once again, we look that there was something that was happening. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but there, many theologians believe there is a separation between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Because the world was without form and void. Since when does God create anything that is full of confusion? Something had to happen there. 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us, For God is not a God of confusion. The King, Sam, King James says, The author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches. So God did not create the confusion. In Genesis 1.2, The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. 
Now, when we read this in Hebrew, we read it just a little bit differently. That word was there, the earth was void, is haya in Hebrew, which means to become, to come to pass, to happen, to fall out. It's, it's not a statement of fact. It's a statement that A happened because A happened. We now find ourselves at B. So God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth became void. It fell out. Something happened that caused it to become void. And that word there for formless and void is, is tahu, which means to be formless confusion. The earth became full of confusion. And I like this one. Not only does it mean emptiness, it means unreality. That all of a sudden unreality took hold of the earth kind of like it has during the airwaves when you start watching the news and you start watching these politicians talking and these preachers talking. What you're feeling is a stream of unreality being directed at us. When Jesus said, said, I've come to give you truth and I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that Greek word for truth there also means reality. He came to give people caught in unreality of the world system, the reality of the kingdom. And so we, we see this competing force here. We need to realize that, that uh, many theologians believe that between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 is the fall of Lucifer that impacted the earth. I also believe it was during that pre-Adamic period, and some theologians debate whether it existed or not, that uh, what's interesting to me is when you, when you look at Genesis 1, you look at also what Peter talked about, that the earth that was ceased to exist, there's almost, there's almost an understanding that the earth's crust turned in on itself. How do you think all those dinosaurs and all that stuff and all that vegetation got so far underground that now we have to drill sometimes a mile underground to find the oil? The oil is the old pre-Adamic world that turned to oil under the pressure of the crust. So every time you pump some gas, you're actually running on Satan's old kingdom, I guess. Many speculate that. But we also need to realize that when Satan impacted the earth, when Lucifer impacted the earth, that he loosed his nature into the earth, which is confusion, which is this this unreality. So the very best that Lucifer can give is what we see in Genesis 1 and 2. that's That's all he can really give. When he fell and iniquity was found in him, we need to realize that God did not create iniquity. Lucifer, when he was hovering over the presence of God, that the Bible says he's the anointed cherub that covers. And so he was over the very presence of God that he, let's see if, I want to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. No, that's okay. Uh, that, that he stood over the, the presence of God, and all of a sudden he began to speak things that God did not tell him to speak. He gave the five I wills. In fact, in the, uh, the chapter I wrote for Dr. Tom Horn, I said that he tried to create an artificial grace to lift him up to become equal with God. Because there's five I wills, and five's the number of grace. I will, I will, I will. And one-third of the angels came into agreement with them, and they fell. And it caused all this chaos. But Jesus tells us really what Lucifer is all about in Genesis 10.10. 10, the thief cometh not but for the steal, kill, and destroy. And I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. It's all there. God promises us or, or declares to us in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things long past. Well, how can we do that if we don't read the Old Testament? We're finding out there are more clues to what's going on today that were originated in, in, in antiquity, originated in Genesis 6. and That's part of that war that's coming with transhumanism. They are using science to recreate Genesis 6. And they're actually very braggadocious about it. And so they're, 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 uh, there, there are some that have saying that some of the things that they're doing and almost the terraforming of the planet, that they're trying to get the atmosphere of the planet back to pre-Diluvian state because they knew that there were changes 
in our atmosphere. But he says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is none other. I am the Lord, there is none like to me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So at the beginning, God tells us how the end is going to be. And I think that's very crucial for us to understand because it, there, is, there is a connection as we see that what was released on the earth, all this chaos, all this darkness, we see God's antidote to it. And I don't know about you, but I need an antidote for all the chaos that's going on in the world today. I need it for my family and me. I need to be able to step outside that chaos and have my own canopy of God's presence and God's order and God's reality in my home, in my life, to shield me from all these things. So let's look again at Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. Now here is God's antidote for the work of the enemy. The work of Elohim, in the beginning it was Elohim. In fact, he was Elohim up to the moment that he created man. And then all of a sudden, if you notice in your King James Bible, it says the Lord God, the Lord God. God is Elohim. The Lord is yod heh vav -Heh, or Yahweh. And one of the things that the rabbis understand about Hebrew is yod heh vav -Heh represents the grace of God, the mercy of God. Elohim is the justice of God. How many know God's a judge? He judges the earth. And so the first five days, everything he was doing, he was speaking as a judge, giving commandments. They're, 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 they're commands. The reason that light still is is that, that, that word light be is still in effect and is still enforcing itself. It was a command of God. The moment God started with man, he took Lucifer by surprise because even the serpent only refers to God as Elohim. But when God created man, he also revealed another part of himself called Yahweh, which is his mercy and his grace. In fact, Jesus is encoded into, into yod heh vav -Heh, and I've shared that many times here. So when God began to deal with man, he balanced grace and justice together. But he never offered that grace to fallen angels. It was only offered to his creation. And so you see the work of Elohim. You also see right next to Elohim the distinct and separate work of the Aleph Tav of Messiah. And you see the commandments of God. Without all three, you, cannot, you don't have a snowball's chance in anywhere hot to overcome or to hold on. You, don't, you, don't, you will get swept up in this religious spirit. You will get swept up in this war of ideologies moving toward a one world government, toward a one world religion, toward a one world currency. You will get swept up in it if you don't have the distinct work of Messiah, the full work of Almighty God and his commandments to keep you balanced. You will, you will leave it all to follow the Antichrist. Now, what we see a lot in, in the body of Christ today is some try to take the distinct work of Messiah and separate him from the overall work of Elohim and the commandments of God. You cannot separate Jesus and the commandments. Jesus was the perfect commandment keeper. He was that lamb without spot nor wrinkle. He did not violate one little yod or tittle of the, of the commandments of God at all. He fulfilled it and walked it perfectly as in the heart of the Father when the Father gave it to man. So if you're going to be like Jesus, you need to keep the commandments. We have others that try to take the work of Elohim and, and the commandments and separate them from Messiah. Let me tell you something. The only way that you can stop the, the serpent's seed in you is by the blood of Jesus. In fact, what's interesting, I was listening to uh, Dr. Tom Horn and Stephen Quayle, and they're talking about the, all the geneticists and everything. And they had, and remember Jesus said, you're, you're going to end up where the worm never dies in hell and the worm never dies. 
And many people really tried to figure that out. They, had, they found out that encoded within man's DNA, there's almost like this serpentine type of thing within, within man's. It's the seed of the serpent is when man fell is encoded into his DNA. And when you get saved, it dies. The new man takes over. But if you die without Messiah, if you die and your sin has not been washed in that blood, if you've not bowed the knee completely to Jesus and made him the Lord and Savior of your life and yielded to him, that thing is still alive and it will live forever with you in hell. You see, really, the more that we deeper we get in science, the more it confirms God's word. It doesn't dismiss God's word. For those that are intellectually honest, it confirms it. And yet we have a lot in the Messianic movement today that are denying the deity of Christ, that don't want to talk about Jesus. They all, they, they all get back in, in, into just Moses and the commandments. And how many know the Apostle Paul was very commandment-centric? He, was, he understood these things. He was a rabbi. Yet at the same time, he said, I don't want to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. You can't. You, you can't do it. You, without Jesus, Jesus is the epicenter of everything, but you've got to add the full work of the Father and the Holy Spirit along with the commandments of God that were given by the Holy Spirit, which Jesus looked his disciples right in the face and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then the apostle of love, we're going to find out in First John, said, if you say you love him and don't keep your, his commandments, you're a liar. And to say that, well, you know, the gospel has its own different commandments. If you separate Jesus from the God of the Old Testament, you're serving another Jesus. He is Elohim come in the flesh. He is Almighty God come in the flesh. In fact, if you would take the, the Hebrew letters that yod heh vav heh, it literally means that that God shall be revealed, or, or hey means to be revealed, that twice it announces the coming of the God with the nailed hand. Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh. And he is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. He is not the God of what's being called Abraham and Ishmael and Muhammad. Actually, between Muhammad and Ishmael, there was a separation. And even I don't believe Muhammad is serving the God of Ishmael or the God of Abraham. It's another God. There can be no blending of Islam and Christianity. The Apostle Paul was quite clear. Why, why is this another form of Baal? In fact, originally, if you look at the etymology of the word um, Allah, at one time pre Muhammad, it was Allah Baal. And that, that is just an etymological fact of the development of that name. It is walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the completed work of Messiah, and now his Holy Spirit is on the the inside of me, empowering me to live his commandments. If I don't have that trifecta working on the inside of me, I cannot withstand the Antichrist spirit in the last days. We must learn to walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the distinct work of Messiah who empowers us to do the commandments in the earth because he has redeemed us and because we love him. I don't keep God's commandments to get saved. I I keep his commandments because I am saved and they are the ways of the kingdom that I was birthed into by the new birth. No more than somebody living in Russia becomes an American because they pledge allegiance to the flag three times a day and try to live like an American in Russia. You can't do that. There has to be a change of citizenship. It is the the truth that flows through 1 John. It will tell us, uh, it is how we tell the remnant from the religious. And guys, the religious will fill not only the Protestant churches that reject the commandments of God, but the Messianic movement that is beginning to reject the distinct work of Messiah. In fact, there are many Jewish Messianic Uh, movements today that are actually flirting with denying the godship of Messiah to be accepted back by Orthodox Judaism. All that's going on. The call of the remnant, the purpose of the remnant, and the distinction of the remnant in this day and this hour is to walk in all three. Because when I understand the depth, the height, the breadth, and the fullness of God's love, 
through Jesus, then the full power of the Godhead is perfected in me to walk the way that Jesus walked. And if we're not doing that, we're just being religious and we're not being the remnant. This has just been an introduction. We're just going to take this step by step. It's going to be almost expository, except I'm going to do it like a rabbi instead of like a Baptist preacher. But we're going to take this as long as it needs to go for us. I I want when we get on the other side of this, we really will develop discernment on what I need to change in my life because this is how the remnant lives. And to have discernment that I can look beyond the hype. I think one of the things we need to do sometimes is close our eyes to the things that are going around us to quit looking at the the Hollywood mentality that they have and the sound bites they give and sense in my spirit. Do they have a kindred spirit that has the complete work of Christ working in them and they're walking in the word? Or is that a religious spirit functioning within their heart? Guys, that could save your life in the days ahead. That could mean the difference between the tribulation being a whole lot harder than it needs to be. It could be the difference between still walking in freedom and being in a concentration camp. It can mean a lot of things with what's coming on the earth today. It's time to get serious about our walk like never before. Well, Father God, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you this morning for what the Apostle John gave us, both in the book of Revelation and the book of 1 John. You have given us keys to prepare us. And Lord, I ask that the, that, that, that the uh, anointing of a scholar would come on me as I do these studies. And Father, that, this, that the anointing of a Bible student, a Talmudim, a disciple, would come upon everybody that listens to these videos and watches it on YouTube. Father, that they would have a fresh anointing released in their lives to get deep in the Word and to become holy before Almighty God and walk in that holiness and to become that remnant that are day in and day out moving to become that bride without spot nor wrinkle. And Father, I thank you and I praise you for it in Jesus' name.